A major religious movement that involves speaking to the dead, all started by two teenage girls in New York, in this episode of Spectralities. Welcome to Spectralities. My name is Rick Garrett and I'm a photographer. As an artist, my main interest is the area of crossover between the history of photography and esoteric innovation, the place where the invisible gets fixed and the more concrete medium of photography intersects with ambiguous concepts like spirit. I wanted to start this video series to discuss this interesting convergence of art, science, and occult. I originally wanted to start in with an episode on full-fledged spirit photography, but that wouldn't make sense without some background. So let's just consider this episode zero, where we can lay some groundwork for the themes of future episodes. Today, let's talk about the history of the spiritualist movement. Spiritualism began as a 19th century American movement that gave people direct religious experience, including communication with the dead. Many associate spiritualism with the American Civil War, which began in 1861, but spiritualism actually began in earnest one night in 1848 in what was then known as Hydesville, New York. The two youngest sisters of the Fox family, Kate and Maggie, were sent to bed. Soon, mysterious rapping sounds were heard, and the girls, aged 12 and 15, suggested that the sounds were coming from an outside source. The parents took this extremely seriously, the mom asking some leading questions such as, Is this a disembodied spirit that's taken possession of my dear children? Soon they developed a system to communicate with a disincarnate spirit. Before long, family and neighbors were filling the house to hear messages tapped out in answer to questions such as, how many people are in the room? And how old am I? Through these types of questions, they determined that the raps were coming from a spirit known as Mr. Splitfoot. But that was later amended to be the spirit of a cobbler that had allegedly been murdered and buried in the cellar of the house. Word of the sister's spirit communication spread so quickly that an older sister, Leah, a single mother living in nearby Rochester, learned about the commotion by way of the press rather than from her family directly. She quickly grabbed her daughter and took the boat to Hydesville to investigate, but found her family's home to be deserted. It turns out that the home had been so overrun with visitors seeking messages from the spirit world that the family had to take refuge in the house of one of the girl's older brothers. Why were people so quick to cling to this idea of spirit communication? It wasn't mass hysteria, and it didn't come from out of nowhere. To give a little background, I've come up with a quick list of seven things to prepare people for the spiritualist revolution. One, a backlash against Calvinism, which had been increasingly spreading a message of infant damnation. If a child died before baptism, their soul was damned to hell. With infant mortality rates at a time being one out of two, it's easy to see how parents, mothers in particular, might begin to question their faith. Two, the Fox family lived in what became known as the Burned Over District, a region that had already been swept up in several new religious movements, including the Latter-day Saints and the Millerites and the Shakers. Many people in the area were Quakers, and friends of the Fox family had just left that movement. So many aspects of Quakerism were adopted within spiritualism, including the more personal relationship with the mystical experience and the fact that many Quaker ministers were women. Three, Animal magnetism, also known as mesmerism, after its proponent, the German physician Franz Anton Mesmer. In the late 18th century, he proposed that there is a magnetic fluid that affects the physical and emotional condition of living creatures. This could be brought into harmony through the use of magnets and magnetic passes of the hands. Healing via Mesmer's animal magnetism had a sexual element to it, often involving groups of men and women sitting in a circle with their thighs touching, uh, sometimes using a variety of hands-on approaches. It could be said that Mesmer worked on both a psychic and a sexual level, curing his sexually repressed clients and paving the way for a variety of new religious and esoteric movements to come. While there isn't much serious talk about Mesmerism now, its concepts influenced serious occultism into the 20th century, and traces of it evolved into modern hypnotism. Four, fiction, gothic horror, reflected the public's interest in life beyond death. Obvious examples of this would be Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Edgar Allan Poe. 
Poe's short story, The Facts in the Case of M. Valdemar, directly links mesmerism to the supernatural, involving a narrator that mesmerizes his friend shortly before he dies and therefore is able to communicate with him even after death. <laughs> Five, Andrew Jackson Davis. Largely self-educated, at the age of 17, Andrew Jackson Davis saw several traveling lectures on mesmerism in New York and took up the cause. After discovering his own latent clairvoyant powers, he soon acquired a following as the Poughkeepsie Seer and became an influential writer and speaker. Some of his practices, such as diagnosing and treating illness while in trance state, later became a common practice in spiritualism proper. In 1847, he predicted the spiritualist movement in his book, Principles of Nature. And for the next year, that prediction came true with the introduction of those mysterious raps of the Fox sisters. Six, the invention of photography. With both the daguerreotype and Fox Talbot devising very different methods of photographing people in 1839. We'll get into this more in future episodes, but the idea of disembodying a person's likeness from their physical self is something that we take for granted now. At the time, the implications of that kind of disconnect cannot be overstated. Coincidentally, a few decades later, the Eastman Kodak Company would set its headquarters in Rochester, the same town where the Fox sisters once lived. Seven, the telegraph, invented in 1844, for the first time disconnecting human communication in real time. A direct analogy could be made between the tapping of Morse and the tapping in the home of the Fox sisters just four years later. The first message that Mor Morse, Morse sent? What hath God wrought? So it's easy to see how people would be more than ready for this kind of new direct approach to spirituality. The Fox sisters performed for increasingly larger crowds and inspired others to take up the cause. Some of the earliest spiritualist literature explained that essentially anybody could be a spirit medium. Just get together a small group in your home and try it. Chances were that someone in your group would be able to channel the dead. And if it didn't work out one night, you could just try again until you had success. This highlights the uniquely American qualities of spiritualism. It was inherently individualistic and rebellious. For the longest time, there were no governing body and no leaders. If you said that you were a spiritualist, you were. There were no hard and fast tenets, no cardinal sins, it was an organic, decentralized movement that quickly became a major belief system, by some estimates having 11 million practitioners in America, out of a total population of 25 million. People would gather together to attempt to speak to relatives that had recently passed away, and hear their continued wisdom from respected figures like Benjamin Franklin. They sought comfort from their departed parents and spouses. They asked if their deceased children were being cared for in the spirit world if other spirits were looking after them and teaching them to read, for example. Spiritualism was a new take on ancestor worship in America. To communicate with the deceased, it helps to have someone of the right disposition to serve as an intermediary. As in the case with the Fox sisters, many of these were women. During the Victorian era, women were seen to be more sensitive and passive, and that made them more suited to spirit communication. At the time, Socially, it was completely inappropriate for women to speak alone in public. Unless, of course, they were a trans speaker channeling the spirit of your grandfather or a former president, for example. Soon, not only were women speaking in public, but through this spiritual loophole, their voice was being given serious attention on spiritual and social issues. Spiritualists very quickly linked together with other revolutionary movements, including the anti-slavery movement and the suffragist movement. And why not? A movement that wouldn't blink at rebelling against organized religion and even death itself certainly didn't have anything to fear in questioning social conventions. Soon, women from the spiritualist movement were being presented alongside influential feminist icons like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, whose Declaration of Sentiments and Resolutions was presented the same year and in the same region as the Fox sisters inaugurated the coming age of spiritualism. The Fox sisters went on to give a variety of performances, their older sister Leah joining in and working as their manager. They drew huge crowds, but within a few years, the spiritualist movement outgrew the young women that sparked it. Many years later, they issued a confession saying that they'd made the knocking sounds originally by tying an apple to a string and hitting it on the ground. 
and then later by cracking their toe joints. But then the confession itself was recanted. The story of the Fox sisters is fascinating and deserving of much more time than I'm able to devote here. So uh, I'll just include some links to some books below in case you're interested in some further reading. Before long, the spiritualist movement travels to Europe and takes a different turn, but we'll get to that in a different episode. Now, I want to take a second to make it clear that spiritualism is not a relic of the past. While it may not be as widespread as it was at other times in history, there are still spiritualist churches in most major cities. So, now that we got all that out of the way, uh, let's stay tuned for the next episode where we'll finally be able to dig into the beginnings of spirit photography. In the meantime, if you enjoyed the video, uh, please like it below, share with your friends. Also, I'd love comments, uh, maybe what you liked, what you're curious about, any questions you have, or even suggestions for upcoming episodes. Uh, so stay tuned for the next episode, and in the meantime, thanks for watching.